Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to call the meeting of the City of Santa Rosa Design Review Board to order on this uh, fantastic Thursday in February. Weather hasn't decided whether we're still in winter or if we're headed into spring, but today is spring. <laughs> um, Patty, may I have a roll call, please? Let the record reflect that all board members are present. Thank you. And uh, item number two on the agenda is approval of the minutes. We have in front of us item 2.1, which are the minutes from January 16, 2020. Any corrections, changes? Seeing no one uh, nod, we'll go ahead and uh, put those into the record. Item number three, board business. This is where I read our statement of purpose, defines our board versus other boards and commissions in the city. Uh, project review, the review authority shall consider the location, design, site plan configuration, and the overall effect of the proposed project upon surrounding properties and the city in general. Review shall be conducted by comparing the proposed project to the general plan, any applicable specific plan, applicable zoning code standards and requirements, consistency of the project within the city's design guidelines, architectural criteria for special areas and other applicable city requirements, i.e. policy statements and development plans. So that's our purview as a board. And uh, at this time, I would like to open up for public comment any items which are not on today's agenda, but would be under the purview of our board. And each speaker will have uh, three minutes. We've got a new microphone, quasi center of the- Built uh, just for me. I'm a happy dog. <laughs> My name's Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland. I wanted to thank you and say Happy New Year to you. And then also give you that extra special thanks because you're the first responders. Oh, they're calling for you right now. So here's the thing. First responders on the city's California climate emergency. That was passed in a resolution by the city the other day. You are the foot soldiers for this effort. You probably didn't realize that when it came down, but that's the truth of the matter. If you're gonna have any kind of effect, it starts right here in the design of a project and what its footprint's going to be on the ground. And as it says here, the overall effect of the proposed project upon surrounding properties. Now, I was at a meeting yesterday where development was going forward and it was pretty much shown to be almost by right that pretty much people can come in now and go like, hey, this is what's gonna happen. And the surrounding community doesn't get much real voice in that situation. So what I wanted to ask you about doing is taking it upon yourselves in a way to begin a dialogue with the community early in the process. You get some of these sometimes, but it's not as, oh, I know the word, robust. It's not as robust as it should be. A community should never have people come to a meeting and say, well, I couldn't find the information and I didn't know who to talk with about this. It should actually be that it's well advertised, you're the first responders that they come to you and get the news they can use to save their community, especially if the overall effect is gonna be killing something, making it worse. So in that meeting last night, I was considered the old fogey basically because I'd been around that block a bit. New people were there and they hadn't been around the block. They didn't really understand what was going on. And it was kind of sad because they got they got bounced. It's like tough luck, it's going to the next step real quick. Next week, planning commission. A lot of them are real concerned. They asked me to come down and get the appeal papers. So I picked those up. And that's not the kind of thing we wanna have happen. It's the kind of thing where you wanna say, right in the beginning, we worked together and we had a community understanding. Maybe not complete unanimity, but a consensus where the people who are gonna be affected by the buildings next to them can have a bit of a voice in it. Now I'm gonna come in here later, I might not be able to stay the whole time, but I'm gonna tell you, I like taller buildings with less pavement footprint and less parking. And you put the taller buildings away from the neighbor, 
If it's right next door, you go into it. Three for free. Thank you, Timely. Thank you, Mr. DeWitt. Appreciate it. Any other members of the public wishing to speak? Seeing no one approach the microphone, I will close the public comment period. On to abstentions by board members. Any board members need to abstain for item 6.1 or 6.2? Um, yes, I'll need to abstain from 6.2. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any others? Seeing none, we'll move on to our scheduled items. Our first item up is item 6.1, which is a public hearing for a preliminary design review. Old Dominion Freight at 2960 Dutton Avenue, file number DR18046. And we have a presentation from Planner Ross and the applicant. Thank you, Chair Kincaid, uh, members of the board. The item before you is the major design review for Old Dominion Freight located at 2960 Dutton Avenue. It's a new trucking freight transfer terminal on an undeveloped 8.45 acre lot. Um, it's, it involves one 17,695 square foot building with 34 loading dock doors. It has a 4% parking reduction, 224,901 square feet of new paving on site. It's estimated to have eight to 10 pickup and delivery trucks per day, two line hauls per day, uh, operating seven days a week with staggered employment shifts. Um, the entitlements included in this project are the minor use permit for the use of the truck and freight terminal, the major zoning variance for 30-foot light poles in the rear of the yard uh, for truck safety, um, and the major design review here before you. It is within the Roseland area um, specific plan, which um, delegates final design review to uh, the director level, so staff level. Um, so today we're asking for preliminary uh, design review approval. It's in the um, southwest quadrant of the city. A Little bit of history on this project. In 1999, the design review board approved a similar project with the, and adopted a mitigated de negative declaration. It was two industrial buildings. Both sizes combined to approximately 127,348 square feet. And then in January 2016, the Planning Commission approved a recommendation to City Council to change the general plan land use from general industry to light industry. Um, and it, the first addendum to the MND was approved. Up there it says amendment, it should say addendum. On March 2016, City Council approved that land use change. In July 2018, uh, the Planning and Economic Development Department received the application for the project. Um, through that time, there was proper noticing um, and uh, referral and, and review by staff, uh, project completion. And on December 12th, the uh, second addendum, the major zoning variance and the minor use permit were all approved for this project. So here's an aerial of the parcel site. So the general plan amendment was requested to basically make it more, uh, the zoning more compliant with the, uh, make the general plan more compliant with the zoning and the surrounding uses. Um, this was a one random kind of uh, general plan land use designation. This one kind of made it all um, cohesive. It's uh, intended for area, the light industrial, um, Land use says uh, zoning is intended for areas appropriate for some light industrial uses as well as commercial uses, activities that may be incompatible with residential, retail, and office uses. Here's a um, an approved site plan. So there's an entrance here. There's um, employee parking in the front, and all of the uh, large tractor trailers would be in the back. There is a seasonal wetland that is being um, preserved with this site, um, which is part of the reason why there is a variance request for the lighting, uh, as well as a 4% uh, parking reduction, and a little bit into the landscaping, which I'll, I'll talk about in a, in a couple slides later. Here are the elevations uh, provided. Here's the floor plan. Uh, the front half facing the street is more of the office use and the back half is used for um, the truck freight terminal portion of the site. 
So here's a landscape plan. As you can see, there's the um, seasonal wetland with uh, some landscape buffer, some landscaping here uh, in the front, separating the street uh, pedestrian pathway, the new sidewalk with the existing park with the proposed parking area. Um, one of the things that we talked about during the process was orchard parking, um, but due to some of the constraints, such as the seasonal wetland, and there's a a um, a railroad heels, uh, a railroad spur from the smart train track, as you can see how the site kind of curves a little bit right there. Um, it'd be really tight on parking to, with a, a greater reduction that would have to have been requested um, if we had the orchard style. So we came up with uh, kind of something that reached the intent where it's more of the triangle boxed, um, planter to to four trees to be placed there instead of the um, the planter island that would be uh, otherwise um, uh, uh, favorable with the city so just to run you through the lighting um, there if they were to have the 16 foot poles to comply with city code you'd have lighting throughout the site as shown on these dots as well as surrounding um, which would inhibit the use of the site just some maneuverability elements as well. As you can see, they're in the way of the, the truck, uh, the tractor trailers. Ultimately, staff agreed with the applicant team for 30-foot light poles, where there are some interior, but it's less than, two than what would be required with 16-foot light poles. In addition, the 16-foot light pole limit was um, uh, a bit too short for the um, sizing of the tractor trailers. Here's the lighting rendering of what those 30-foot light poles would look like. Um, there are some existing on the property south that exceed the 16-foot as well. Um, those were probably built before it was um, annexed into the city. So environmental review was codified with the Planning Commission on December 12th for this project. Um, it was a second addendum to the uh, MND that was approved. Um, None of the, there was nothing associated with this project that would be greater in scope or more of an impact than what was previously determined from the original MND. There are no unresolved issues, uh, no public comments received in response to the public hearing notice either. So with that, the uh, Planning and Economic Development Department recommends that the Design Review Board grant preliminary design review approval for Old Dominion Freight, a new 17,695 square foot industrial building on 8.45 acre parcel, located at 2960 Dutton Avenue, uh, APN number 04313053, to, uh, file number DR18-046. I'm Adam Ross. That concludes my presentation. I can answer any questions you may have. The applicant team is also here to go over um, any additional comments you may have. I think they might um, have a small presentation. We'll go ahead and have the applicant presentation and then we'll go into questions. Welcome. S so my name is Sean Eaton. I'm with AE Urbia Architects and Engineers. Um, we've designed the, the building for Old Dominion Freight Line. And um, uh, I think what Adam Ross has already gone through is actually pretty adequate in giving you an idea of what the project is. I have materials here if they help answer questions. And so I'm more than happy to go through all of this with you and answer questions on that. Um, it's really a simple project. This is an industrial building in an industrial zone doing light industrial stuff. So let me know if you have any questions. Understood, thank you. Um, before we go into question and answers, uh, I will open up this item for public comment. Anybody, any, any member of the public wishing to speak on item 6.1, you will have three minutes. Hello, Hi. Uh, my name is Robert Twin. I work for Canine Companions for Independence. We'll be your guys' as neighbors right across the street. Um, I did have a chance to look at some of the attachments, but uh, not all of them. Would the lighting variance um, just be towards the back side of the facility or would that cover the street side as well? 
and um, yeah, we just wanted to check in about the uh, parking requirements for the trucks um, and, and, and ensure that that's in line with um, code in terms of having space to park the trucks and maneuver the trucks and not uh, use the road mostly for those purposes. So yeah, those are our questions. Thank you, we'll make sure those questions are uh, taken by the applicant team and or staff. Any other members of the public wishing to speak on item 6.1? Seeing none, I will uh, close the public comments for item 6.1 and bring it back to the board. Drew, we'll start with you. Questions for staff or the applicant? Uh, I've got a procedural question, I think, for Bill and Adam. So you guys are asking for preliminary because final is deferred to director level, but if we so determine we could do both to make your lives easier, correct? Cool, all right, uh, so that's good news. And then um, I was looking at the parking count and I guess I'm a little confused, maybe. Um, so uh, maybe you can help interpret this for me. So the office building is X square feet and it requires 18 spaces by code and the industrial facility is X square feet and requires X spaces per code. So together, that's how many spaces are being provided. Is that correct? Correct. There, two, less. two less. Yes, there's two less being provided. It's a 4% reduction overall. We did right, yeah. sp split yeah, up. I, I'm getting that. I just wanted to make sure I'm understanding. So then, so I have a question. So of the two, you know, so now there's 54 spaces, right? Are there 54 people occupying this facility? Okay. N like never. So there's going to be a bunch of empty spaces on, on the regular. Okay. So I'm wondering then... If parking is a concern, potentially, it, are we kind of hemmed in with the zoning code, or could we provide? Is there an is there an extra variance we could do for them? Because it seems like we're heavily overparked. You know what I mean? And we already have the wetland. That's, I'm just asking a question. We're going to figure that out and okay, let you cool. know right now. Yeah, it's just. I was looking at it and I went, oh, I'm counting, you know, office desks in the building, and I'm like, wait a second, there's like. 20 people in this building at most. So I just thought I'd ask. Yeah, and there's bicycle parking and like, I mean, great, there's bicycle parking, but it's not exactly bicycle accessible in that area of town because it is industrial. So that's my question. I haven't I'm seen a bicycle rack on the back of a tractor trailer rig. Right, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think uh, the applicant team can answer the parking requirement. Sure, go ahead. So as the parking lot's currently designed, the parking that's directly in front of the office actually has probably four more stalls than we actually need. And that includes the office personnel and the dock workers and the yard workers. The parking stalls that are actually to the side that are uh, across that driveway, those are reserved for line haul drivers. So that would be men that come, uh, men and women that come and drop off their vehicles, get in their tractors, pick up a trailer and go do deliveries. So and so really based on our current usage and what we kind of expect as a five year projection of expansion, we expect that um, this will be adequate with an additional four stalls. We're comfortable with the number of stalls that we've come to. Um, we probably would have gone ahead and provided the extra two stalls required by the city ordinance. However, space being a constraint, uh, we went ahead and uh, went for the variance in order to make sure that everything complies. Yeah, and I'm seeing the fence around that side parking lot now, now that you mentioned that. So, okay, that makes sense. Uh, that answers my question on the parking. And those are all of my questions. Thank you, Drew. Henry, questions? I think uh, Drew hit spot on. What I was gonna ask was how many um, parking spaces are, are reality in. Uh, I would be in favor of, if we can find an avenue to reduce it further to exchange that parking for some trees and some canopy. And I think uh, I think the new building code and the landscapers on our board can probably speak to it better than I can, but I believe we have to have 50% canopy coverage after 10 years of trees maturing in parking lots now. So 
I don't know if you've taken a look at that. I've, I've looked at it on some, some recent projects and uh, need, need more of those fingers to, to get that done. But that was, that was gonna be my only question was how much parkland is real, really needed here. Thank you, Henry. Warren. Yeah, I don't wanna do any duplication, no questions. Thank you. Brett, questions? Thank you, Brett. covered it, as they're saying. So. Adam, questions? Um, for substance, these guys got the, um, most of it, but I just had one uh, point for uh, Adam, and I don't know if this is important. There's a typo on uh, page four of your presentation for project location. Just is important to um, address that you have 925 Piner Road um, on the map, so just so it goes into record as it's, it's correct in other places, but there. And then uh, you answered uh, some of my question for, uh, I was wondering the difference between the types of hauling that, so line haul, uh, the drivers will come, drop off their cars, and will they bring their own, is line haul versus delivery distance wise? Is, I'm just kind of curious. So um, line haul, typically the, there are the city drivers and there's the line haul drivers. City drivers will come and the tractors are usually parked here and their own personal vehicles are what they take to their own residence. Um, they will switch over to their tractor vehicles, pick up a trailer, and if they're a city driver, they will do local deliveries. Okay. If they're a line haul driver, they'll actually pick up a trailer and take it to another facility to have the freight swapped out. Uh -huh. And so okay. that's the difference between the two. Okay. The reason we have the secured lot is okay. because line haul drivers may be gone for several days or even a week, depending okay. on which location they need to take the trailer to. Okay, yeah, thanks for clearing that up. As in, just uh, for the descriptions, kind of wondering the different classifications. So. Thanks, that's all. Thanks, Adam. Eric, questions? Real quickly, I'm glad to see that CCI is here. Um, and I would encourage some dialogue, ask questions in regards to, I know that you have a new program with PTSD clients, right? With noise, sound, light. Uh, and that's where my concern is in regards to this project in regards to the height of the uh, light standards in regards to the impact on CCI and their PTSD uh, clients that are there. Yeah, um, all the lighting facing the street, basically in front of the, the proposed building and the, um, the gated area where only the tractor trailers would be, the parking would, for the tractor trailers would be in the back. You wouldn't, it would be screened from, um, from the street. All of the lighting in this location are normal standard lighting height of 16 feet. Thank you, thanks for addressing that. So strongly encourage you guys to continue some dialogue in the city to reach out. I'd like to add just a little bit to that. Um, we, we did get the variance for the 30 foot poles, but just where the tractors are because um, the 14 foot trailers cast a shadow from a 16 foot light makes it really difficult to maintain safety in the yard. However, we are also held to the California standard for lighting where we have to have full cutoff shields and anti-glare fixtures. And we're currently working with the building department to make sure that those codes and ordinances are followed. Awesome, great to hear. And hours of operations, and did I see you're looking at only eight to 10 trips per day? Is that correct? Um, yeah, if Adam, if you want to go back to that other slide that shows the trips per day and the, the hours of operation could potentially be 24 hours if a line haul driver ends up showing up in the middle of the night, he'll come, drop off his rig and then go home. Um, however, the actual facility itself will usually run either from, um, you know, six to six or seven to seven. It's usually get ready for the morning deliveries, receive the end of the day delivery guys back. Um, that's generally how it works. And it is eight to 10 delivery trucks a day, trips in and out of the facility. It's, um, I, these are semi trucks. Um, and this is, this is an end of, this is a destination point. This isn't a hub. 
And so generally what happens is a truck shows up here, the freight comes off of it. The freight that comes off of that trailer is for local deliveries. Got it, I appreciate it. And then, um, so driver comes in the middle of the night, they're able to park in the facility rather than on Dutton Avenue with the refrigeration units running, et cetera. Yeah, so um, when a driver shows up, he has an RFID that's, in, that's installed on his vehicle that gives him instant access to the site. Um, he also has access to the restrooms that are in the building. The rest of the building is locked down, and then um, he can drop off his trailer and tractor and then get his vehicle and leave. Awesome. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Eric. I guess in following to that question, maybe to fully answer the uh, speaker's question is, uh, is are there any uh, restrictions for parking on Dutton Avenue currently, future? I think there's an overnight parking restriction, if I remember correctly. So I think during the daytime they can park, and I don't remember the time, but I believe it's an overnight parking restriction. Okay, applicant. As for the operations of Old Dominion Freight, they don't like leaving freight unsecured. They want all of their trailers behind the lines. So as a matter of policy, we won't be parking on the street. Great, sounds like it will be a copacetic neighborhood. Okay, um, now we can entertain a motion and then get into discussion. Yeah, I'll go ahead and make it. Um, I move to grant preliminary and final design review to Old Dominion Freight 2960 Dutton Avenue, file number DR18-046, waive reading of the text. Thank you, Drew. Second. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Um, comments, Drew? Uh, no, I, I agree with the architect. I think this is a pretty straightforward building. It's industrial, It's it looks like it's supposed to, but all four sides have been addressed. And I feel like we've seen it before, and I was scratching my head about that. I think we've seen it at Concept maybe like a year ago, I feel like, does right. that sound about right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think it was fine then, because uh, it is what it is, uh, and it is in an industrial area, so. Um, and if we can't really do anything about the parking and you guys have addressed the wetland, I think you're good to go. Thank you for a complete package. Thank you, Drew. Henry, comments? Are we gonna hear whether we can do anything about the parking reduction? Uh, parking reduction question again. Can we do anything to reduce parking? So the code requires that um, if it's a 25% or, or less parking reduction, it can be granted by right or attached to another entitlement. In the case of, in this case, um, if there is already a use permit required, it would be attached to that. And in this case, it was with the Planning Commission. Um, that doesn't mean you couldn't ask for more landscaping or, or a change to that, um, what's kind of in there already. But as far as, in short, uh, the parking was settled with the Planning Commission. Yeah, too bad, because we could reduce it more, I think. I think uh, we have that support here to do that, but um, in light of that, no no other comments. I think, I, think uh, I didn't see it a year ago, but looking at it now, I think it's fine, it does what it's supposed to do. Good luck with it. Thanks, Henry. Warren? Yeah, I don't really have any friendly amendments. I, I will say that I know that the uh, the whole Salamander uh, mitigation ranches are dwindling in size and number, and it's it's interesting in a thankful way just, just letting the wetlands stay on site. It pressures the rest of the city for that. Um, being a destination unloading area, you have a, a fairly large maneuvering area. It's it's pretty big, and I'm not here in any way to, uh, to upset that because you have to offload trucks, you have a lot of maneuvering area. In some ways, the whole orchard tree issue is as we build more blacktop, we cook our earth more, and you can do as much to uncook the earth with less asphalt as plant trees. But um, again, there's no friendly amendment I have. Um, it's, it's a fairly large maneuver area you have, and if you need all that space, because 15 trucks are gonna need everything offloaded by 2 a.m. in the morning, I'm not here to trouble that. So 
Have fun. Thanks. Thank you, Warren. Brett, comments, friendly amendments? Um, I think um, one of the things, I guess, mainly is just the um, maybe consider some additional um, screening at Dutton, um, as well as maybe larger um, tree selections for the street trees. Um, just again, getting back to the urban heat island and, and things like that. I know it's also policy is kind of right tree, right place, but um, it would be, I think, um, it'd be beneficial to, you know, screening the building as well as being kind of, you know, kind to adjacent neighbors and, and some of the other office uses or commercial uses across the, uh, across the site or across the, the roadway. Um, and that would be my only consideration. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Adam. Yeah, everything's been pretty much uh, well covered. Um, I would, uh, um, my one comment would be to um, echo Brett to um, go away. You have a lot of 15 gallon trees spec um, and not very many larger trees. And so to really, you know, one of the, the feedback that big pieces of feedback that you're hearing is to get that canopy going. And so to go with some more bump up the percentage of larger trees to begin with um, would be helpful, I think, with that. Um, but other than that, it, it looks fine to me. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Eric? No, nope, nothing additional. Great. So um, with our board, if you hear consider, it's just that, consider. Uh, if you hear shall, then it's like you're going to do it. So uh, I'm hearing a consider. I don't think there's any harm in uh, yeah, that consider I actually, as a friendly amendment. I had one question that I just kind of stumbled upon. I think I, I missed this when I looked at it. Um, you have two fences shown on your A105 sheet. You've got a chain link fence and you've got an iron fence concept. And I just, I'm trying to figure out where each one is. And, and it looks like based on the renderings you guys did and based on the notes I'm seeing on the architectural site plan, it, I can't seem to find the iron fence, if that makes sense. Would it possibly be the gate? Yeah, the iron fence looks like it's the gate component, but I, I don't know. But I just wanted some clarity on that. So I believe the iron fence is referring to the gate, which is an aluminum frame, not necessarily iron, but it's an iron style that creates a more robust gate that can handle automatic opening and closing on a regular basis. So that's what that's referring to. And then the balance of the fence around the rest of the site, including the parking lot, the front parking lot, and everything else would be chain link with barbed wire. Is that correct? Okay. You guys have some issues with that down there? Yeah, so that was my only concern. But it seems like it's fairly well planted around it to kind of hide it. Okay. So I heard a friendly amendment of consider additional screening in the landscape planting at Dutton and consider larger trees throughout. Does that sound about right? When do you want to make the friendly amendment? Okay. Um, yeah, I'd like to make the amendment to add, um, consider um, additional screening along Dutton and to increase, consider increasing the size of the trees throughout the project. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Brett. Does the motioner accept the friendly amendment, Drew? I accept it. Does the second accept? Yes. Excellent. Patty, may I have a roll call, please? Board members Weigel? Aye. Wicks? Aye. Um, Sharon? Aye. Cordenbrock? Aye. Hedgepeth? Aye. Goldschlag? Aye. Kincaid? Aye. Congratulations. And we're going to take a five minute recess while the uh, next applicant team sets up their presentation. So, thank you.
simply the front, the front of the vehicle. And I could see three data seats. That's all just regular car parking. You might see it being short light. Just that kind of stuff. So I really hope that the frontage is what it needs to be for your guys' benefit. Yeah, no, and I actually put There's a lot of traffic at night there. There's a lot of kids that fool around. Yeah, a lot of people race, donuts. Well, so um, there's a lot of that. Truth be told, when we install our facility, we are 100% about security. Okay. So we're going to have lots of cameras okay. in and out of facility for you to kind of make things work. And the site lighting, not only for safety, but for, for uh, um, making sure that the cameras see everything that goes on. And so I don't know if that helps. I think so. And they'll never, they'll never park on that road. No, okay. They'll always pull and go. I mean, the only way that they would be able to put their blue up right there, and they, there's a way to open it anyway, but they never open it. They just walk out there. Yeah, the storage place yeah. still uses it quite often. So, yeah, yeah they'll, so they'll, they'll be traffic, well, yeah. They use right where... Yeah, I know. Yeah, right where, yeah. 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 Right right where your guys... Like less <laughs> but they're, they're, they'll never park out there. Okay. You know, it's just, they want to keep everything. Okay, it looks like we're all back, so we'll reconvene the meeting. Um, <clears throat> next up is item 6.2. It is a concept design review item at 3575 Mendocino Avenue, multifamily development. And I guess we have another street, 422 Angeles Street, file number DR10-022. And we have uh, Planner Triple. Is that, is that not, am I reading something wrong? Sweet. Oh. You go to the. Uh... <laughs> yes, chair, that does sound appropriate. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just reading off the screen here. Well, thank right, you. And get triple. It's all yours. Great. 
Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members of the uh, Design Review Board. Um, today, rather than having a planning staff um, present a brief uh, project overview, uh, the applicant uh, team led by Karen Massey has a, has a detailed, thorough, excellent presentation that they will offer. So uh, planning staff will just offer a few opening comments and then turn it over to the applicant team for their presentation. So the, uh, the proposed 3575 Mendocino um, project is a 532-unit multifamily development uh, located within the Mendocino Avenue Priority Development Area. Pursuant to the resilient city measures, required design review is reduced to minor design review with concept design review required. So the project comes before you today for required concept design review. Other entitlements required for the project would include a general plan amendment to Transit Village Medium, a rezoning of the entirety of the project site to Transit Village Residential with an additional combining district rezoning on a portion of the site to senior housing. And then a, a tentative map to subdivide the parcel into uh, five lots. And then of course the project is required to comply with CEQA. So with that, um, and uh, if there are no questions at this point in time, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Karen for the applicant team's presentation. I think that's appropriate. We can take questions collectively afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is Karen Massey. As Andrew said, I am the project manager for 3575 Mendocino Avenue. We're extremely pleased to be here this evening to have the opportunity to present our preliminary concept to you. What you see before you is a culmination of two years of hard work to get to this point, largely focused on assisting the prior residents in the prior Journey's End mobile home park, and also working with city staff as well as state officials to figure out how to get the park closed. So we're happy to report that on January 14th, the city council took action to formally close the park, which enables us to move forward with the redevelopment plans and be here tonight. So thank you so much. I'd like to start off by introducing our project team. Uh, there are two components to this project, an affordable housing component and a market rate component. So we've assembled a, a team of qualified uh, development partners comprised of uh, BRJE Communities is the affordable component, comprised of Burbank Housing, as well as Related of California. And on the market rate side, North Bay Mendocino Holdings is our market rate developer, led by Darius Anderson, Jay Wallace, and David Gensler. Also here this evening is our consultant team, Rick Williams and Kushal Modi from Van Meter, Williams and Pollock, our master planners and architects, as well as Christine Talbot and Rick Carlyle, our civil engineer. Before we get started, we wanted to let you know that this project design as well as uh, closure of the park has been a culmination of pretty extensive outreach to date. And so we wanted to share with you a little bit of the uh, partners within the community that we've reached out to, that we've presented the design to, solicited their input, um, and continue to do so as we move forward through this process. Set the stage a little bit for you, um, the site context. The site is located within the Mendocino, Mendocino Avenue Corridor Priority Development Area. That development area is a corridor that's designated for increased residential density, uh, especially because it's located near transit. The site is located within one half mile of Bicentennial Way, and Bicentennial Way is one of the highest quality transportation corridors in the city with bus service every 15 minutes. It also has direct access to existing bike lanes. And the existing uh, built form uh, is one that's fairly unique in that our neighbors are all large commercial or institutional uses. So the massing out there is, is fairly large and multi-story. Um, the site does have some access constraints. We are limited to access only to Mendocino Avenue as we have Kaiser Permanente Hospital as a neighbor to the south, the Mendocino Overchange to the north of us, and Highway 101 to the west. Within a two mile radius of the site, there are a number of key amenities, um, including medical services, a major grocery store, commercial services, employers, et cetera. And all of these characteristics helped inform our development plan um, and make it a key opportunity site for locating high density residential housing near transit services and employers. 
As we considered our redevelopment concept for the property, we reviewed the city's goals and objectives, uh, namely the general plan, and reviewed each of the, the elements, land use element, housing, urban and design. And what we found from those elements is that the general plan is really seeking to foster a compact development pattern, locate higher density and affordable housing near transit, provide a variety of housing types for all income levels, and also locate housing near shopping and employment centers. So we we considered all of these factors as we considered our redevelopment proposal. So our, our project master plan, I, I see Rick over there ready to jump in. Our, our project master plan uh, seeks to redevelop the entire 13 acre site, again with the two components of affordable housing and market rate housing. The proposal is for up to 532 multifamily rental units. All of these units will be rental, none will be for sale. 162 of those units, or 30%, will be um, affordable and kept affordable through a regulatory agreement, and then up to 370 units will be the market rate units. The site has really been designed uh, with a central feature of three-quarter of an acre central park, which includes a children's play area for the multifamily units, a dog park, sports court, and passive areas. And then um, a, an important piece to the design of this project is the circulation network. We've worked cr closely with the city's development staff and the fire department um, to ensure that there's adequate ingress and egress to the site. So we've arrived, um, based on the code requirements, at a configuration of one main central public street that would be signalized, that's in the middle of the site and culminates in a cul-de-sac, and then two uh, secondary entrances to the project site on the north and south end, which are both right in and right out. And that really sets the framework and the circulation system for the site, after which everything else kind of dominoes. Um, we're also proposing 650 parking spaces, as well as um, many, many bicycle spaces. So with that, I think I'll hand it to Rick. Thank you very much. Thank you, board. I'd just like to... Uh, discuss briefly the primary design principles for the overall master plan, uh, as well as the uh, building design that we'll get into greater detail on relative to the senior housing. Uh, the core design principles include having the primary and secondary entries that uh, Karen just discussed uh, that were from the uh, fire code, and we worked with those with the fire department here. Uh, but we wanted the project to feel like a neighborhood, a series of interconnected streets while we have private driveways. We designed those to function and look and appear like streets and feel like streets with street trees, parallel parking, uh, white sidewalks alongside them. And then the buildings would face all of those streets and drives uh, throughout the main core area of the development. While we've located a majority of the parking behind the buildings internal to the buildings or tucked behind them, uh, or in the back along the perimeter edges, where, which are also primarily hidden from fencing by fencing or sound walls. Um, also, we're in greater detail with the senior housing currently. Uh, the the uh, market rate housing will return for concept design review at a later date for the details of those uh, buildings uh, in the future while the senior housing is brought forward in a concept design review. Uh, the market rate rental housing will follow many of the same uh, principles uh, and organization characteristics, uh, be three and four stories, will be a mix of one, two, and three bedroom uh, apartments, ranging in size, we believe, from approximately 600 square feet to 1,200 square feet. Uh, we're at the range of approximately 1.5 parking spaces per unit to come to the 536 parking spaces, and we'll include the required bicycle parking as well. And we'll meet all of the development standards. We've looked and anticipated that those uh, developments, uh, that this, that development will be similar in pattern and character to a couple of the other recent developments that have been in Sonoma County, one in Petaluma Altura, uh, and the other one, the Annadale Apartments in San Rafael. From a design character and sensibility, we believe that that is sort of the type of housing that the residents of Santa Rosa are looking for. Uh, 
the, we've really focused on uh, the streetscape along Mendocino Avenue, both in a, from a landscape and building uh, standpoint. We have a transit uh, bus stop uh, right at the entry at uh, Mendocino Avenue at our main intersection. We've worked out the location with the transit agency. And so this will really be our main gateway element in, but we anticipate facing Mendocino Avenue, the extended way, and we will get into greater detail on that, but could also discuss what some gateway features and elements that might be appropriate to, you know, to kind of landmark the uh, entry to the overall uh, neighborhood. Uh, the secondary entry closer uh, to the north uh, at the major intersection is really a ride in and ride out, um, but we anticipate it being similar in character, although it's highlighted by a landscape, kind of sculptural landscape element and feature that is, uh, at, uh, that is viewed from the intersection and really creates a landscape feature at that area that really we feel needs to have some greenery at it again. Uh, the landscape design, we're fortunate uh, to have Christine uh, Talbot from Quadriga here, and she is going to uh, go over the larger master plan concept for the landscape design. Thank you. Hi, I'm Christine Talbot from Quadriga Landscape Architecture. And like Rick discussed, we really looked at this area as a whole neighborhood and we wanted it to feel like a neighborhood. So the street tree placement, um, the screening from the highway, and from Mendocino Avenue and really creating that pedestrian feel along Mendocino Avenue was very important to everyone involved in the project. Um, tree line streets, some shade, and really uh, making opportunity for people to, to walk and take mass transit. Um, as Rick discussed, we envisioned a monument kind of idea, more of a, a living monument, a living sculpture at the corner of Mendocino. And um, and um, what is the name of this? <laughs> yeah, Fountain Grove. Thank you. And um, so we envisioned using some of the more iconic trees in Sonoma County, some larger oaks, and raising them up in a more sculptural pattern to create a separation from the vehicular traffic and the pedestrian traffic, and create um, an identity for the neighborhood that could be incorporated throughout and be like a landmark through the community. And then, uh, as Karen discussed, there is a central park that's really kind of the hub or the front porch of the whole community. It's multi-generational and um, provides a lot of different opportunities for use. This is a little greater detail of the idea of the sculptural berms with um, the iconic oak trees at the corner, really creating a space for people separate from the street. You know, we, we have these intersections that are just so monstrous with cars in every direction and they're so inhumane that we really wanted to create a monument and a gateway that wasn't um, kind of your standard gateway, something that was more living and part of the landscape. Um, you can see the typical section along Mendocino Avenue where really there's existing pistache trees there that we're looking to keep because they match the trees across the street. So it's a nice um, thoroughfare through to downtown. Um, and we're looking to create more of a double tree lined walk there and create some separation against the, tr the street. Right now the sidewalk is right against the curve line. So we're gonna move it in and add some planting and keep some of the existing trees there. Um, and yeah, double row of trees. The park is really, you know, a, a great use for everyone in the community and especially for um, the seniors to have uh, access to activity and healthy walking and uh, exercise and just, just that multi-generational activity and interaction being able to see people of all ages interact together is so healthy for a community. Um, so we looked, it's a small space, you know, three quarters of an acre, but we've got a lot of stuff packed in there. So there's a uh, passive space with picnic and shading. There's a half of a sports court, uh, exercise equipment for all ages, kind of a central gathering space. It could be used for outings and events, movie nights, things like that. 
um, an interesting playground that's not your normal playground, and then a small dog park that's really just for people to meet with their neighbors and um, you know exercise their dog just on a daily basis. This is a, a great character image of what that park might look like. Um, looking back towards the senior housing and the market rate housing, um, just tree-lined, everyone's using it, something for everyone, and um, the, the center of the community. And another nice view. Um, and how it just becomes, again, the idea of the front porch for the community and a place for people to gather. The street sections, um, the typical private drive street, like Rick was discussing, you know, we really want to emulate the idea of a neighborhood and not make a driveway that people live on. So we've incorporated the idea of the street trees into the private drives so that it feels like a real neighborhood with um, trees and walkways. And in, also on Mendocino Avenue, the same thing. There'll be separation from that traffic. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, as I mentioned, the senior housing uh, is, is, has been brought to you at greater detail. There's 162 units, primarily one bedrooms, a few two bedrooms, and a manager's unit on site. Uh, predominantly, the building's three, uh, four stories with some uh, locations where we step down and modulate the massing to, to two and three stories. We have 114 parking spaces. It's approximately 0.7 parking spaces per unit, which for affordable senior housing in this area of a community, we found to be the appropriate amount of parking, not too much, not too little. Uh, there's gonna be extensive uh, amenities, multi-purpose rooms that spill out into three separate courtyards, uh, media rooms, a health and wellness center, laundry rooms, bike storage, large ones to emphasize biking. More and more seniors are actually using bikes to get around uh, than, than ever before. Managers and reception offices and community gardens, which are uh, the most popular social uh, mixing area for the residents that we raise all the planters up and uh, and so they're all handicap accessible and even I don't have to bend over and pick uh, when, I, when I'm uh, doing a little planting. Um, it is for uh, low and very low income seniors and it will be uh, controlled with a 55 year agreement. Uh, some of the design features uh, include, and we'll see it in some of the other uh, images we'll show you, that we've really tried to bring the building entries down to the scale of the individual to make the front doors not kind of magnificent tower on the corner, but bright, brought down in scale so that the arcade and the, the you get sun in the plaza at the entry and the, and the seniors feel welcome and feel that they can come into a, a place that is theirs and their home. Um, there's really an organization of the facade as a building, as a base, a middle, a top, which we show in the elevations as well as the images. We wanna frame the street as well as the courtyards to give them some privacy. But one of the things that we have done is we We've turned one of the courtyards out to the public street so you see the activities of the seniors in a courtyard that has some protection with a low wall and trellis for planting. But so you see activity from the outside, you know that it's a senior housing development and it also connects an open space uh, that's private for the seniors with the larger central park directly across the street from it. So we kind of connect that open space between the two. And reflecting some of the surrounding commercial as well as other recent multifamily that we showed you images to, we are looking at a contemporary style which also has some of those traditional elements and level of detail that are uh, we feel is appropriate for a development of this scale and for the community uh, that it's within and surrounding. Um, the building plan, it's actually in the 162 units are on three buildings that will be in either two, two or three phases. We're anticipating buildings one and two going first. Mo a lot of the amenities are in the phase one, building one. You can see the community rooms going out to the courtyard, a large double height entry, 
the management and leasing offices that keeps track of people that are coming in and out, a uh, little extra additional security, large laundry rooms and elevators so that every room is accessible. And then we have in this particular uh, building and in the others, we have a connection directly through from the front door to the back. So people that are coming from the parking enter into the same lobby and it has a similar experience, uh, particularly in building number one. Uh, there are residents at each floor level um, and, uh, and it's a similar uh, building format. But we have common spaces in each of the three buildings with elevators in each of them and building one and two may be interconnected depending on the eventual funding of those. And we have lobbies, large lobbies and entryways at the corner at Mendocino, uh, right at the courtyard and building one, and at the corner entry lobby closest to Mendocino on building two, with separations of approximately 20 feet between the buildings where we have walkways that allow some, some peeking into uh, the uh, courtyards from the street. So we see that what's happening in back before we get to courtyard number one, where you really get a real image of what's happening in the courtyards. Uh, uh, this is the elevation uh, of the uh, building uh, one at the street. You can see how the massing is broken down and we've lowered the scale of the building as, it, uh, as you enter into it. And then the building along the street uh, is also articulated with a series of bays. Uh, we have a, a base along the bottom. The bays kind of grow up from that. We have a body to the building, which is a somewhat neutral to color. And then we have a, uh, a, t a greenish color on the top, which gives a top, a strong top to the building as well. So there's a great deal of articulation in the building, change in materials, change in color, and trying to create a strong base as well in a more traditional uh, organization of the facade. Uh, this is the uh, main entry at the, at the public street. You can see here how that elevation translates to the corner. We have uh, a little small seating area and plaza in front, some protected. It kind of connects you directly to the bus stop. And we use uh, a unique material at the entry lobbies. We're using a, a panelized phenolic panel uh, for the entries. It's a high quality material, deeply recessed windows and nice trellising to really bring some warmth into the uh, development and we carry that through some of the detailing on the project overall. So you can see how that elevation and principle of the facade is brought along the street and how some areas of the top are brought down at the corner and, and the changes of materials that we have. We actually had a resident meeting recently and they actually, uh, that from all the former residents of Journey's End, about 30 of them showed up and they appreciated the colors that it wasn't just gray and white and black. Um, and so this is a kind of a close up of that same corner view. And you start to see some of the sun shading devices. We're using the sunshade devices and some of the uh, materials on the facade to warm the palette and have bring in some wood to it. It'll, uh, we've used this in other similar developments and we'll show you some images on that. And that also all that wood is fire treated as well. And so that will, uh, it, it, it will be a material that uh, well, wears well over time. Thanks. Uh, this is once the entire three phases are, are uh, built out, this is an appearance from the uh, park looking into that courtyard and you can see that it does two things. It, it shows you some of the outside activities within the senior housing development and it also creates a large articulation in the over, overall streetscape providing a lot of greenery at the street and uh, breaking up the massing of the building uh, as, as it uh, proceeds along uh, the new public street. And then when we get down and take that same massing down to the entryway of building number one, we have a small plaza with a seating area out in front. When it's a little cooler and the sun isn't so hot in the morning, you'll uh, be able to sit outside of the trellises. If it's hotter, you can move back into the trellises, allowing the residents to uh, 
to meet all their neighbors as people are walking around. And part of the planning effort is really to create a, a healthy community uh, where residents are walking, the dog park, the, open, the park space, and a circular walk around the entire housing development provides the seniors an opportunity to get exercise both within their community and extend out to the multifamily and the rest of the residential community. Uh, some of the details that we are uh, illustrating here, we show the material, a, a different material, but a similar uh, concept of having the top change material, um, the phenolic panel, uh, as well as the details around the windows and the sunshades that we're anticipating using. And then the raised gardens on the right and the wood trellis that helps screen uh, the courtyard as well as the trellising that we use uh, for uh, shading uh, at the lobby entry level. This is an extension of another senior housing community uh, in a hot, commun a hot neighborhood in Fremont, which uh, shading was really important for the residents to have throughout. Uh, I know you may not always be interested in the interiors, but the, but the residents very much were. Accessible bathrooms was a big issue, and having some of them be roll-in showers, that is not a photo of a roll-in shower. We do encourage walking, even though we have elevators, and we show we also put stairs into the lobbies. And then the two-story heights give a grand uh, entrance for the residents. Uh, making them feel like this is really a home and an important place and it's their residence for, for many, many, many years. Full kitchens and also we use materials on the inside of the building for healthy interiors and air quality. Um, the courtyards will be similarly appointed as a central park with activities, gathering spaces, seating, and as many uh, raised planters as we can fit in, as well as integrating in our stormwater management into the project. Uh, and we are looking at uh, sustainability from the construction process and demolition, the reuse of asphalt, to all the way to the, from the community gardens, bicycles, uh, solar uh, and, and setting it up for solar, as well as the stormwater management so each aspect is really something that we're working uh, through as far as sustainability. These are the key principles that we have for both the master plan and senior housing as we discussed today. And uh, if you have any uh, questions or comments, uh, we look forward to having a conversation with you on these and any other issues you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Karen. Um, <clears throat> even though this isn't a uh, public hearing item, we're gonna open it up for public comment. Um, so at this time, I'd like to open up item 6.2 for public comment. Any members of the public wishing to speak have three minutes. And I see Mr. DeWitt is back. Could you please put up the slide that shows the affordable senior housing? <clears throat> Elevation. Yes. Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland, and someday I'll be a senior, so I have some interest in this. And the best senior housing I've ever seen has been in multi-story buildings in Amsterdam and in Denmark, Copenhagen, oh, Sweden also, Norway, what the heck. What they would do with this is put more units in. So I encourage this team and you folks to think big. And in the middle there, put in two and three more stories, go up higher and then take out parking spaces. And you know what? I don't think you need 80 bicycle spots. I'm the only guy that ever rides a bike to these meetings. I'm probably the only guy here who's ever gotten his bike to the bus stop there at Journey's End because I used to go to Journey's End when it was a young spot. I was one of those people that saved Journey's End from being destroyed for a Home Depot 25 years ago. I know this site inside and out. What I would like to see there is for people to take that chance right now and go for even more housing and less pavement. Change the floor area ratio, let them go higher in the middle, make it kind of a, uh, when you're on the freeway and you look up, it looks like a bit of a pyramidal type situation six stories in that middle, five stories coming down. We get, I'm sure we get another 100 
units on this thing, maybe 200. Heck, when I was laying there dreaming, I was thinking 1,000 housing units out there at this site, as big as it is. Some of those senior units don't need to be really big. And I know they're gonna do the market rate with its studios one, two, and three, so they'll be trying to get bigger units. But from my personal experience as you get older, you don't need as much space, especially if it's just a man and a woman together, or then it's just a widower or a widowee. It's down to a smaller space. So please, you folks be the ones that lead the parade and say yes, more and less at the same time. More building space, more FAR, and less asphalt and footprint. And yeah, those bicycles. Over in Scandinavia where it snows, they have that inside down in the little storage space they give them, and people get the bikes and put them inside. That's especially important here because this is the home of Bike Thief Central. Sonoma County, bike theft is a number one activity of the Krankensteins. They're out there roaming around all these neighborhoods now, just looking to get whatever piece of hardware they can. So thank you for your time, appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. DeWitt. Other members of the public? Good afternoon or good evening. I'm Keith Diaz with the Sheet Metal Workers. Um, thank you for hearing from me. Um, couple, well, I have a question. Is this going to be public works? Is there any kind of uh, public money that's going to fund this? And if we'll make sure that's answered when okay. we get to question and answer. Per, but per, uh, thank you. Sure. And uh, but I just uh, we talked about the building. I like the design. Um, of course, you know, actually bigger is better. I'm in the construction industry, but um, also I just want to, when it gets built, I want to just be, you know, the, of the developer being cognizant of trying to uh, build it with area uh, local people um, using our apprentices that live in the local area. I represent the sheet metal workers, but also our mechanical, electrical, and plumbing um, and sprinkler fitters. So we would love to be able to work on this building. So I just want to put that into public comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diaz. Any other members of the public wishing to speak on this item? All right, seeing none, I will close the public comment and bring it back to the board. Um, <clears throat> Drew, uh, we can start off with questions and then uh, we can get into comments in a little bit, but questions for the applicant and or staff. Okay, I think I'll go, yeah. I'll do questions, like we talked about. Um, so, it's funny Mr. DeWitt mentioned the go higher. That's actually one of my questions. Is there a uh, zoning limitation for height density that, I, I'm, you probably mentioned it, I'm just not remembering it. Uh, no, I don't believe we have mentioned it in the presentation. The um, proposal would, uh, would be a general plan amendment to um, assign the uh, Transit Village medium land use uh, classification or designation. And then the rezoning would be to rezone to uh, Transit Village residential, uh, both in terms of the density, the project does achieve the maximum density allowable under the general plan and uh, the maximum height allowable in a Transit Village residential zoning district is four stories. So um, in both cases, it reaches the maximum limits for what our uh, current code allows. Cool. So my question then is, so if we, the applicant team, <laughs> I guess I should say, uh, if they went for more affordable housing as part of this, would they get concessions to go higher and go denser? Yes, they could apply for a density bonus to, to both increase the density and uh, then use a concession. Yeah, could they the, go for a density bonus with the current affordable housing component or would they need more affordable housing? I don't know the answer to that. I'll get back to you on that because yeah, I do fine. want to do the calculation. Uh, that's fine. Okay, cool. Um, and then uh, if I'm not mistaken, it looks like the parking garage is three stories tall. Is that right? That's tucked in the corner? Okay, cool. And then it's adjacent to a four-story building. So you could theoretically go to four stories on the parking and have it hidden behind the four-story building, right? You know, 
and it is also directly adjacent to the uh yeah the the current parking garage at kaiser yeah yeah, yeah. that was really why it was kind of generally located yeah, cool. in that position and then um and if if i might chime in sure thank you um just to remind you that the market rate component is, has that we've shown you tonight is a concept um, because the market rate developer is a little bit behind the affordable development. Um, and so that is not necessarily the way that the market rate will develop. So there is a possibility that anything that is shown as three stories now could potentially go up to four stories. Uh, the limitation in the entitlements ask, as Andrew said, is up to the 40 units per acre of the uh, general plan land use designation, which takes us to up to 532 in the unit count. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm getting that. Um, so uh, Christine and maybe I guess, is it Rick? Is that right? Uh, on the street design, what's driving the 26 feet? Is that a city? Yeah, with that, that is the fire department. That's the fire department. Okay, great. For anything over from three stories or above, right, you that's have right. to. I always that's what the that. 26 feet is from. Let's forget that, man. God, it feels so wide. Uh, I, the reason I ask is it 26 feet for this type of street tucked back. 26 feet seems like a, a super highway in a way, right? In terms of like urban density. And so, um, you know, in terms of a lot of uh, like new urbanist work that are, have similar uh, layouts such as this, there's medians or other things to break up kind of the, the massiveness of the, the street. And, and I, I just have this, I don't know, I just have this fear that 26 feet is too wide and people will drive too fast and then you won't have as much kind of pedestrian interaction with the street. So we'll just let fire have their say on that 26 feet, I guess, for slower traffic. Um, we are hoping to get large enough trees. We understand, we'll work with them to provide large enough trees to get that canopy up to try to give it a sense of scale yeah, that reduces exactly. the appearance. Um, okay, those are my questions. So, uh, if I might respond to your question about the density bonus. So the project uh, as, as currently proposed would have 532 units, um, 162 of which would be uh, low income for, for low income or very low income households. So that's roughly 31% uh, of the project, which would qualify it for a 35% state density bonus. Uh, if we would apply the state density bonus, then the project um, could achieve 719 units. And then of course would have um, a maximum of three incentives or concessions. So while the applicant team may be encouraged to consider that there would not be a requirement to yeah. pursue that. Um, and that, that actually, uh, sorry, this gives me another question. So I know that we're, uh, we as a city are looking at the FAR in terms of as it relates to downtown um, and its components. Is there another, is there another zoning available to the applicant aside from medium density transit village residential that would potentially increase their density on the site in addition to any potential state density bonuses, et cetera? Or are we kind of, I mean, a, a little, I mean, because this area is not obviously the, the downtown core in terms of that FAR and, and whatnot. Um, I think that there probably is another land use designation that may be applicable to the site. That would be the transit village mixed use land use designation. That designation, as I understand it, is the city's uh, most dense designation that is available. It exceeds, uh, it's 40 units to the acre and higher. Um, when we originally started looking at this site for redevelopment, that was the land use designation that we started at. And as we started to put pen to paper and, and start fine tuning our cost to construct, we realized that going over four stories was going to be cost prohibitive because the rents just weren't there to make the buildings pencil if we went any higher than four stories. So that we're obviously trying to create a, a project here that we can make pencil and that was certainly the limitation that um, held us back to the four stories. Yeah, I imagine what's limit, limiting that is the, the construction typology. You would have to go to something different with a podium and concrete fire rating and all that good stuff. And so by staying at four stories, you can do everything in type five and do it all out of wood and essentially potentially even go to modular. Each. You just, you just Ar architect, architect, architect. Yeah. Yeah. Type, type so, five, type uh, three, type three is about 
37 percent more expensive. Yeah. So that's I, I yeah it, it sounds like that was the case. I just I think it's I think it's important for uh, the public to understand the constraints yes. that exist on going denser um, because while it would be nice to go pie in the sky and say hey let's build you know a 10 story structure that's you know type one or type two construction which is concrete with fireproofing and tons of a lot of systems that uh, you know may not be supported in terms of the rents that could be generated to offset the cost of construction etc so that's something that I think developers look at it pretty heavily uh, when they're trying to figure out how to pencil it out so I just think that's important that's hence the point of my question so thank you that are, that's those are all my questions I'm hogging the time sorry guys we got plenty of time thanks Drew Henry yeah it saves me from has, having asked uh, the question so um, guest parking more for the applicant is there going to be designated guest parking for for the senior house for the, for the senior yeah. sorry uh, the way we're looking at it right now, we have uh, on-street parking that we're anticipating being predominantly uh, guest, guest parking uh, and on-drive parking. We do have, we, we, we've calculated with the 0.7 parking spaces per unit that we will have enough parking for both the residents and guests that, that come to the uh, senior housing development. We, we still have a little bit of parking analysis to do. Um, and when we do that, we oftentimes, while there's a propensity to want to designate all the spaces for the residents by management staff, at times we leave them open, allowing them to have a parking space there. But by not designating it as their space, it gives more flexibility, unbundling the parking is a phrase often used. So they have a parking space, but they aren't guaranteed a particular one. And that uh, allows for more flexibility in visitor parking and the use of parking allows us to reduce the parking ratio slightly to uh, to achieve other goals that we have. Um, procedurally, Andrew, we're, we're really just looking at the senior component tonight, that the market rate project will be brought back to us? Uh, yes, that's correct. And I would note that um, through the inclusionary housing ordinance, the project would be eligible for one incentive, and uh, the applicant has indicated um, a, a parking reduction incentive for the uh, project. And Henry, I might add that if you have comments on the overall master plan as it relates to the site, I would make them because this is going to go into tentative map first and then we'll see it and everything will be locked in. So thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Um, so when you were talking about the unbundled parking, is that as it relates to the general overall plan, the master plan, if you will? not just the three sites that is going to comprise the affordable unit? Typically does address the, uh, the senior housing. I'm not sure the strategy, but it is a, we are anticipating reduced parking for the, uh, from what maybe the market might generally uh, consider desirable for the, uh, for the family. Uh, Multi, for the market rate, but that hasn't been formalized and determined because because the mix of the units is still in flux somewhat, and that will determine a lot how many parking spaces are finally in the plan for the market rate housing. And, and I, I might jump in here too. Um, two things, one with regard to the ratio for the affordable housing development, we're proposing a reduction uh, to approximately 0.7 units 0.7 spaces per unit, um, and Burbank Housing is a local nonprofit developer. We have many, many affordable uh, communities here in Sonoma County. We've been working in Sonoma County for 40 years, as many of you may know. Um, and one of the things that we did as we were looking at the ratio for this site in particular was we did an assessment of our other senior communities to see what the existing parking configuration well, was as well as current usage, excuse me, and um, the 0.7 is consistent with the current usage that we are seeing in our other facilities with a little bit of buffer in there to make sure that we have adequate parking. Um, and of course, th this site is proximate to transit and the high quality transportation corridor on Bicentennial Way. We're really trying to encourage folks to 
move away from their automobile and onto public transit. We've been working closely with the city departments and the transit department in particular to uh, create incentives and programs to encourage that ridership um, and we'll continue to do so throughout the project. With regard to the market rate, uh, I believe the ratio that is proposed currently is about 1.4 and that ratio is commiserate with what the zoning code allows for uh, market rate multifamily in um, transit oriented areas. So that, that was where the, the logic and rationale came from for the reduction. Okay, awesome. Um, is the park, the 130 acre park, is that is that tied to the affordable or is it just part of the overall master plan? And when will that be built out is actually really my question. Yeah, the three quarter acre park is tied to the overall master plan. Uh, we have not quite worked out the phasing for the project yet. Um, it's one of the items that we are working through with both staff and the market rate developer. Um, but we envision that that will probably be developed fairly early on. Um, Andrew, has there um, been a traffic study done on this project yet? A uh, traffic study is currently being prepared. Okay, that's, that's my questions. Thank you, Henry. Warren. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I was uh, curious between the, um, the Mendocino Partners LLC, um, when you start with a parcel and I'm, I'm looking at Rick and the, and the, the tentative map, you have this collective piece of land and you get to have um, triggered incentives with senior housing that potentially, if you look at the whole 13 acres, if it's a singular parcel, there's eligibility for garnering these, um, these incentives. And my question here is we're gonna divide, we're gonna split the parcels, there's phasing. I've heard about Burbank that they're, they're looking at probably a tax credit world where they've got a phase one and a phase two. My question stems from you know, the, the question of being all in on the financing. As Mendocino Partners rallies together and all these streets are needed and fire lanes need to be built, um, the question of what their timing is on financing ties into the question about things like parking management. There, there will probably need to be some kind of um, beyond cordial management strategy on how the senior uh, facility is managed with its parking and how the, the private sector, um, I would imagine that, that car count or cars, um, either they're going to be limited in cars, are they going to bifurcate the rents? So when I, if I were to get a market rate unit, maybe this is a question now, I can't buy seven cars, I have to buy, I have to have a, a certain amount of cars. And for cordiality over time, since we're already reducing um, car count to 1.4 on the market rate, the, the dialogue and the legal issues between the senior housing and the market rate and how cars are managed on the property and how people get along and steward. Um, that's as vital in this um, unbundling, shall I say. And it ties in with the financing and how long these phases take. I don't, I don't know if uh, I'm not hearing that the, the Mendocino partners are here, but is it like a two year window? We're gonna build this out. Is it seven years? Um, any, any anticipation of commitment on that party at the table. As you know, at this point in the process, we are very early on, and so those are still some of the questions that we're working to define the answers to. But appreciate you raising the, the issue and the concern. Thank you. I know there are a lot of anticipations in the future between Uber, Lyft, and um, I understand a lot of communities are looking at miles traveled for traffic studies, which is less, um, the brain injury and the cost of alternatives, it's huge cost to applicants to do traffic studies um, without miles traveled. Um, I know a lot of communities, everyone's buying more and more cars, there's fewer buses, so it's this never ending mess of, of trying to come up with large stacks of paper justifying uh, how, how traffic's done. And if, if Santa Rosa is entertaining the miles traveled, and we can sit at meetings like this and not have big lumps on our head with what, what does this mean and, and how are you going to show CEQA happiness? That's a question. 
uh, uh, Santa Rosa will have to do more than entertain VMT because we will be required to evaluate VMT uh, effective July 1st. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, that's near sooner rather than later. So the, so the tools will be here so that we can rest assured that whatever the, the state Senate and, uh, and assembly houses do, we'll be behind it and safer for it. Thank you, Warren. Adam, questions? I think uh, a lot of questions have already been asked, um, but uh, in terms of uh, streetscape and circulation, um, uh, I'm not seeing any bike lanes or anything in, in the circulation pattern. Uh, we, we have such a wide street, we didn't feel like we needed additional bike lanes. With the, the microphone just so. Oh, sorry. Um, we felt that with the street, we, we know that there'll be a bike lane eventually on, on Mendocino Avenue, but we didn't feel with the width that we needed them on the street. We'll probably consider a Shero on the Shero on the, cul okay. uh, the cul-de-sac street uh -huh. um, and, and look at that as a possibility. And well, we didn't want to make them any wider than, than the street already needed to sure. be. Um, so uh, we're exploring that and then uh, and then we are really focused on the crosswalks and the walkability of, of the community so that each of the intersections in, includes uh, kind of enhanced visible crosswalks, including some of the drives that are internal to the development. Uh, so focused, focused on that a little bit more mm -hmm. than, than the overall bike circulation, although we feel that with the multiple access points and multiple egress points and kind of the network of uh, drives and, and paths that we have, that it'll be a very bikeable area with slow moving traffic. Mm -hmm. it, it does go to, you got the, and I, I do appreciate the thought that has gone into the crosswalks and the ball bats. Um, the, uh, you, you are prioritizing the parallel, parallel parking and the street parking um, um, over, you know, and, and Drew mentioned the, the really wide streets also. So there's concern necessarily about big boulevards. Um, but in thinking of potentially getting some of that parking off the street rather than having two parking lanes, you know, or two parking strips to prioritize some to kind of squeeze the cars a little bit, emphasize the pedestrian and bikes even a bit more if possible. So, um, but that was ma it was mainly a question turned into a comment um, um, about uh, yeah that that circulation, um, especially if you're thinking of people getting around the site, going crossing the streets, kids um, biking around, you know, circuits going to the park. Um, yeah, for uh, even for you know seniors um, having their you know it'd be nice for them to I could envision a slow moving bicycle lapse there rather than heading out into Mendocino something like that so to really really emphasize that that slow moving pedestrian bike access that's my questions thank you Adam Eric questions a couple questions thank you. Um, can you provide a little more detail in regards to the solar energy plan and all electric? I know it's in the design narrative, but it's pretty generic at this point. So uh, we we are in the midst of working with a couple of solar companies to size what our potential for the site would be for solar, uh, uh, predominantly on the roofs. We've explored it a little bit with carports as well, um, but we are not planning carports currently on the senior development. So we're really looking at what our maximum potential would be for sizing uh, solar on the uh, rooftops. Uh, so uh, we are going to have that information. We're also evaluating the building for all electric. Uh, versus having a solar hot water and gas for the main water heating. So uh, so we're looking at both both systems currently. We are required in, uh, by most of the funding for affordable housing to pre-wire and prep all the buildings for solar. And oftentimes, in the process, we also structurally put in all the connections and everything we need uh, for the support of the solar panels on the roof. And even as we're proceeding through the construction, if we don't have them in the base, 
project immediately, we often eventually have them placed on the roof even before construction's over. So we're looking at all the availability, funding, uh, and what what is provided for tax credits for, for solar today will be dramatically different in a year. Um, or two years or three years or four years. So we are going to about keep that on the table throughout the process and we hope that we'll be able to accommodate uh, a maximum solar system on the, on the roofs of the buildings as we uh, proceed through construction. But if not, they will still be prepped for being able to be there uh, at any time, and we have had projects that would come a year or two later and still have the solar installed on the buildings because they're prepped and set up and the space is allocated for them. Good, thank you. Um, the only other um, thing that I note is, you know, it shows for the senior affordable housing uh, capacity at 162 with 116 parking spots. When I count them, I come up with 92 and even less if you delete the spots that are marked for trash staging, staging as well. So I'm not sure where the conflict is there. Uh, we We've, count, we've counted them multiple different times. Um, they include, uh, we do, in, they ask us to include the street parking in front of the building. Uh, so we do include that, but we have some parking underneath the buildings as well that is tucked under. So we have those units as well. And we have some on the side, on the private drive, the parking on one side is also uh, for the seniors as well. So um, that's the overall number as we have it. We will double check it though, I promise you. Which is why you've counted it multiple times yourself, right? <laughs> okay. Um, I think those were the only questions. Um, and the parking garage is then in the master plan set, not in the affordable That's senior right. housing, correct? Um, okay. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. And uh, I'll ask Mr. Diaz's question uh, since it hasn't been covered yet. I, I guess since you don't have financing lined up and that sort of thing, maybe you can just speak to, in general, based on the funding stack, um, what is the likelihood that you'll be required to hire apprentice uh, and or union labor um, to facilitate the construction of the project? Thank you. Um, so at this point, we really are uh, not sure what the funding sources will be exactly for the project. There are several public funding sources that we are considering, um, including community development block grant disaster relief funds, as well as disaster relief tax credit funds. Um, and so based on the requirements of that funding is what how we will proceed. In general, though, those oftentimes require a certain percentage of Prevailing. prevailing wage and yeah. um, and then also to that end, uh, what are you doing as far as mechanical? Uh, so HVAC, I know the, the rooftop is full of uh, area for solar, so how are you handling um, HVAC? Uh, so we're evaluating two or three different systems currently. Um, we are in the new code, so we are going to have uh, we're gonna have ventilation to all the units. We'll have uh, a system of air conditioning uh, for each of the units. We'll have some smaller scale condensing units on the roof. It'll, we'll place them so that we strategically don't minimize the solar. Uh, that's the, but the, the roofs will be pretty busy up there once we get them. Um, and uh, so we, each of the units will have uh, AC, uh, individually uh, for them, and they'll also have uh, MERV 13 filters for uh, indoor air quality uh, and, and ventilation, which is now required by code. We have two or three or four systems that we evaluate, and as we work closer 
and start to get our financing. Uh, we will be working with the, our general contractor to uh, make sure that we get a cost-effective system that meets all of our clients' needs and our, and our residents' needs. And just as an example, uh, a recent uh, similar senior housing development I actually just moved my mother in line to that we designed, so now I'm really under the gun uh, after eight years of being on the waiting list. And so, uh, and she has air conditioning and loves the new raised planter gardens that she has, doesn't have to bend over for, and uh, operable windows, and, uh, and, a, and a nice kitchen, full kitchen. It is electric, and uh, I think that it, each of the appointments of the, uh, in the community space, et cetera, are for, are for quality living for the residents, and they generally uh, stay there for a very long time. We've also reached out to Sonoma Clean Power to see about the opportunity to create a partnership with them for this project. So we're anxious to advance that conversation. Great, thank you. And speaking to the livability, can you speak a little bit to the programmatic aspect of the storage um, rooms with the storage lockers? Just, I mean, I, I think I gather what they're useful for, but it, it is space that you're giving up that could otherwise be a unit. So I'm just wondering what the residents enjoy about that. We have found that there's a uh, the, the, a number of, you know, there's different populations in each of the residential communities. Um, some of them have moved from from a home at some point. Some are homeless, and so it's a mix of population. Um, but they also have their life belongings, and one of the things that's kind of nice is when they move into a, to a new community that they don't have to give all of those trinkets and tchotchkes up. We've noted in one of the pictures that at the front doors, often they're displaying their some of their life out in front, and that is their front door, and it's welcoming. Uh, but the things that they only use at Christmas time, things like that, that they really don't want to give up, that don't really have a place in their living space every single day, it gives them the opportunity to have a place that they can store it, that it's secure, and it, it's secure and only uh, accessible by uh, that resident. Um, it is kind of somewhat visible because it's a cage more than it is a room often. Um, but it also doesn't take away a living unit because we place them on the inside corners uh, where we would have other storage room space. So it isn't, it, we aren't trading storage space for an apartment. Uh, we are trying to maximize that. But when you do have unique building forms and you have an indoor inside corner, let's use it for something that is not just extra space, but it's for the residents and that they can uh, continue to hold on to parts of their lives that they want at Christmas time or at another event. And, uh, and I think it, it does well for them and it brings them a little comfort as they move into a new home that they aren't abandoning their whole life as they uh, proceed forward, because it is a new life that they bring to that community. Great, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, I don't have any further questions, so let's move into comments about the project. Sure. I love how I'm in the hot seat all the time now. This is nice. Uh, I don't make the seating chart. I know, right? <laughs> Golly. Um, so first off, uh, I want to say a big thank you to uh, the Burbank team and uh, Van Meter, Williams, and Pollock. Um, this is what I would consider a superior concept level package. So uh, as a member of Design Review Board, I really appreciate getting these sorts of packages because then it gives us a robust set of things to look at, both your design intent, uh, materials, finishes, and also I think kind of globally the plan for the entire project. Um, so I, I think I kind of hinted at this a little earlier. <clears throat> uh, this is a little bit perhaps out of my purview on the Design Review Board. Uh, because it's not really uh, part of our job, but I am going to say this. <clears throat> I think we, you guys need to stuff this property full as m much as you can, um, and so I would encourage you to investigate going to four stories everywhere if you can and pursue the density bonus if possible in, with the inclusion of more affordable housing. Um, I think uh, we've seen a lot uh, in the last couple of weeks here in our county related to 
homelessness and other things and folks looking for affordable properties. And I think the more affordable housing here, the better. Um, of course, there's a place for market rate because that's how you offset the affordable units. Um, so I think trying to find a way to go four stories everywhere, uh, I would be okay with it from a design standpoint. Um, I think the, the building forms and the massing can support it with just an addition of an extra floor, frankly. Um, I really like the building forms and the massing. Uh, I like the materiality of most everything. I'm not in love with the color, um, but I think that's something you guys can explore. Uh, I mean, the you picked probably like the most bland Trespa color on the planet. Um, for, uh, I know there's a bunch of different Trespa colors that are more intriguing that might be worthwhile to look at for your building. Uh, the stained concrete, or the integral colored concrete, the Davis color, I think is kind of unique um, in trying to set a base material and then moving up. I like, the, I like the concept behind the color scheme. I just didn't like the full execution, if that makes sense. Uh, so I think explore maybe some brighter colors, uh, less kind of beige. Feels very institutional, I think, when we pursue earth tones and beiges. As, as nice as and appealing as they are on kind of smaller projects, I think when they start, the palette starts to get larger, they feel kind of institutional in that sense. Um, I, uh, I really love this aerial uh, kind of rendering of the whole site in terms of how uh, everything plays together with the park, the uh, amenity building for the market rate housing, the kind of just the way that the site's organized is really, uh, really very thoughtful. Um, you crammed a lot into a, in, in, into a big property, uh, but it doesn't make it feel, um, I think, overstuffed in a way, if that makes sense. Um, and I, I think what, what's kind of uh, nice about this particular property uh, is that there are kind of some similar things going on across the street in, in a much less dense way. Um, so I think this, this kind of belongs in, in a way in terms of the forms that you've created, uh, but you've, you've up, up the game a little bit, which is nice. Um, and then, I mean, beyond that, I, I would say just tr look into some different colors. <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd be interested to see, when we see the market rate housing, I'd be interested to see what the um, kind of the eventual revelation of the uh, the entry portals becomes. I mean, the, this idea of the little obelisks is, is kind of interesting, but I'm, I'm curious what that fleshes out as uh, at the two drives in, and I, I guess maybe that's more dependent on the traffic study in terms of if another traffic light gets stuck in here maybe, or I'm, I'm not really sure how that impacts that. Um, Christina, I really like this kind of sculptural berm idea to kind of soften that heavy traffic corner and kind of protect what's behind it. I think it's gonna be really unique and, and cool. Um, I wasn't quite sure what it was until I saw the picture up here and you sold me on that with that picture. I thought it was really cool. Um, and then I guess my last comment, it was a question that came up, I think, during um, our other questions. But it's, it's a question to the applicant team. What's the advantage of subdividing the lot as opposed to developing it all at once or maintaining one owner? It's kind of a weird subdivision too when I looked at it. It's kind of like, it's, it's almost like the phasing of the projects, but I guess I'm curious about the advantage of subdividing the lot. So the um, current property owner has owned the property since I want to say the 1950s when the mobile home park was originally developed. They That family intends to stay in the property and in the deal. So both the affordable developer and the market rate developer, the position in the property is a long-term ground lease. So that kind of dictates how the project moves forward. And then as far as um, a parcelization standpoint, uh, BRJE, the affordable developer, felt that it was very important to locate the senior affordable in the southeast corner of the site, most proximate to transit and Kaiser and the services uh, for walkability and convenience largely. Um, and so that, that kind of started to, to start to set the parcelization from there. 
Yeah, and, and funding requires a separate ownership for the affordable component in particular. There's that, that's the piece that was, I think, that, that makes me understand a little bit the, the mechanisms behind why the parcelization is, is important here. Because I think from someone outside looking in, they're gonna say, hey, why are you breaking up this parcel if you're gonna develop it all together? But when you break it down to that level, it makes more sense. So those are my comments. I think this is a great project. Um, we need more projects like this. I feel bad that we're a little hamstrung uh, by the zoning code a little bit, um, just because of where this is located. If, if it were located in a different spot, we could go denser, but because of where it is, we're kinda where we are, we are where we are. But I think you've maximized it as much as you can. I would encourage you to try to go further. Uh, I mean, five, whatever, 540 is great. 730 is better, right, in terms of uh, housing need. I know we always talk about that. I think we just, uh, Councilman Rogers just shared uh, some data on this about we've only built X number and we were supposed to build this and much. I think he's, he's, he's kind of been harping on that lately. Um, but thank you very much. This is a great package and I can't wait for this to go forward. And uh, I'm glad that we don't have to see it again in a good way. So thank you. Thank you, Drew. Henry, comments? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for bringing us a very complete concept package but I know it didn't open, happen overnight and uh, I've got to look at it for a week and it, uh, on work that you spent the last couple of years on. So uh, in, in that week that I've been reviewing it, I, I had a hard time trying to find something to give you constructive to change about the project. Um, but I did, I did have a question before I finished my comments. Um, this building right here, that looks like a um, gathering center or a some sort of community aspect to it. Maybe a grocery store. <laughs> Could you tell me what that is? So that is a concept, <laughs> uh, and one way that the site might be built out uh, that is depicted more as uh, probably gathering spaces, maybe some gathering spaces with a mix of units, but that is part of the market rate development, and so that is really to be determined as to how uh, that building ends up turning out uh, based on market conditions and demand. Well, um, it is a building on the tentative map lot, though, so. It looks, but on the, on the <laughs> and, it, and in some of the other general plan package, it looks like it's more apartments and not a community. That's where I was going with my question. Correct, so the, we don't really know what that building will end up being. That will be up to the determination of the market rate developer, but um, it could potentially be built out as a community building. It could be units. If it is units, those units are accounted for in the 570. 532, sorry. Okay, okay. Um, one more question. Um, the parking garage is back here in the corner, is that correct? So these these units in the front, I'm, I'm guessing this, this main connector pathway is gonna go back and connect to that um, parking garage. Is that a good assumption? So it, it could, but the parking for those units is also partially under the building uh, off of an alley. Um, they could also have some of the parking that's over on the far right-hand side. Oh, that's even better. I, so I, I was just, whole, I'm, I was worried about these. So there's, there's, there's an alleyway? There's there? an alley in between those two buildings. And, uh, between those buildings so that the parking will be. Yep, never mind. I was just corrected by my fellow board member that okay. there is ample parking there. Because I was worried about if he didn't designate some sort of, uh, that these either become visitors parking spots in the parallel spots, that these units are gonna take it all before they get back from the, from the parking garage. And I, and I still think you ought to designate some visitor parking spots, but, um, So, so with that, I think this is a very aggressive um, package and approach, and I think I think the numbers that you've come up with are are more than adequate. I think stuffing more um, in this location might be problematic, and I think the, the traffic report may even bear out my my hypotheses that um, 
this is the right number. I, I appreciate my fellow board members' comment about having more, and more is better in probably the right location. I, I hope that maybe there is some sort of site amenity in that building. I was at a, uh, an apartment building down in, in Corte Madera for the unfortunate loss of the 49ers this last Sunday, but as part of that apartment <laughs> complex, they had, a, they had a little mini store right in the corner of the complex. Um, and I thought that was very, very creative. Um, milk, you know, some of the basics, I mean, it wasn't, you're not gonna get a filet mignon steak down in there, but you're gonna get some of the basics and you don't have to get in your car and go somewhere. I thought it was, I thought it was pretty slick. Um, and I only found it because I, I usually parked in that parking spot where they had designated, uh, de dedicated parking for that kind of mini mart within the, within the complex. Um, so that's my only comment about the general plan. The, the uh, affordable housing concept, I like the step downs at the entry. Um, it's almost the opposite of what I typically do with my designs. So I usually try to upplay them and make them a, a tower element, but I like the fact that it is a little bit more pedestrian level and uh, I think what you've done is very effective. I like the bus stop location. Uh, it's on the right, right spot of the, uh, on the side of the street. Um, I, color palette, um, on the elevations, I generally like it. When I when I got the materials board, I, I kind of felt a little bit like my my fellow board member that there was some some blandness to it. But but given its use, I think it's I think it's actually very attractive and um, wouldn't mind seeing a, a further exploration on it. But it wouldn't it wouldn't uh, I wouldn't make it a a must. Um, the sun sunshade, I, I really like your your sunshade elements with the metal and the wood. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, more projects like this are coming before us and, and wish you guys very uh, quick success with getting it built. Thank you, Henry. Warren. Thank you, uh, fellow board members so far. I, uh, I wanna resonate with a, with a couple things. First, an important thing. I wanna empathize with the need to have a collective opportunity for both nonprofit and for-profit development in Santa Rosa. Um, when we speak about the disaster relief funds, there are very, very delicate things in play. The eligibility to even have those funds has a window of time. You have two years to do it. This is why I was talking about seven years. It's kind of like a flock of Canadian geese coming in. You've got to be dead on before April with, with one set of entitlements, then dead on. You know, these, these numbers go by quickly. It's really an amazing professional effort. I, I want to give you a, a high compliment here. Just the moving parts of Burbank and getting people in, seniors that lost that residence is, is key. The area is not an opportunity zone. It's, it's out of that boundary. And one of the delicate matters is you can, you know, whether it's a 4% or 9% tax credit with the seniors on the, uh, the Burbank thing, I would, I would imagine a developer that can, um, well, Burbank can retain, um, obviously their builder, their go-to builder that can perform on all the construction with the working drawings. That's not an easy subject matter with the larger part ahead. And tonight we're, uh, I, I can see, I, I love the, the, the master plan, the site I can talk for hours about the showers. I, I think it's a beautiful job of trying to suppress the car, bring people to life, give them vitamin D in green spaces. I couldn't be happier with your master planning and everything from even, I think the, the monuments around the oak trees, Christine will hold out terrorists perfectly, um, whether they would, I'm, I'm speaking facetiously here, but, but all these cars and 16 wheel trucks that came down Fountain Grove without brakes, you probably even thought of that because I feel safe um, in the whole project. So my comments in general are, I'm fine with the colors. I see the green a little deeper, but I don't wanna get into a situation in Santa Rosa where something 
synthetic starts to happen because of color preferences. Some people are traumatized in their youth and they hate certain colors. Um, I just want to let go and allow Santa Rosa to develop where an applicant comes in and I don't want to get that specific. So to me, it's, it's a tour de force of helping the seniors. It's a brave moment when this group comes together and, and getting various developers together in a room that can agree with each other and let go and you know whether they want an 11% return. And in San Francisco, it's falling apart because too many developers in the last six year cycle asked for a mandatory return on their investment. Construction costs went through the roof. They're all fighting. Attorneys are making money. In Santa Rosa, what's, what's a happy thing is I don't think you're mandated on, you can keep making extensions on the master plan. It's, it's my hope, and I, I talked about you know, type three, as, as you develop more and more complexity in building typology and higher density, um, I like the higher density. It's just that the question is getting this whole thing financed and having those windows is a very delicate thing. And yes, there could be 200 more units with more general plan issues and so forth. So I'm not here to undermine. And, and I think, um, Drew, the, the, there, are, there are excellent points here about utilizing land. It's the financing issues that are driving things. And right now, we can't get $3,410 for a two bedroom unit. And that's that's pretty much the whole issue here. So I would say this much, I, I loved uh, Henry's idea was was pretty elegant about the uh, the community building having, uh, is it um, between gluten-free bread and whatever is needed. I'm, I'm willing to go from a 1.4 to a 1.2 parking for the market rate side. If you could put uh, both a whole wheat and gluten-free bread in that. Um, I'm working on a project right now with the exact same issues, is why get out of your car later to make more smog to get across a six lane freeway to get your bread. So great, great job. And even if the line niner is lost, your ideas saves the day. That's, that's more important to me, okay? Very good, Warren, thank you. Adam? How can I follow up the bread comments? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> he covered what I was going to say about bread, so. Um, uh, yeah, it, um, just to, to echo, the, um, it's, it's uh, just like Henry was saying, um, uh, examining his package, you know, trying to find things to give constructive feedback on, and um, it's, it's, uh, it's a very well, that well thought out um, site plan, and I can tell that you're, you're that you're all working together to you know I see all of the different voices in this in the plan, which is really great to see. It doesn't seem like anyone's sort of you know really like like you know sort of running the the, uh, the gauntlet here. Um, and so it's it's a it's it's a very nice team effort, and it's a very it, it seems like you're thinking you know financially and um, and spatially. And, and it really comes through. Um, and you know, little details like that, the, the placement of the of the um, the bus stop and the uh, the uh, affordable housing. You know, it's it's great to, to think that you know um, um, elderly people don't have to walk across the entire site. You know, if it made a, you know, it's nice to have that there. So, it's little things like that. It's just an example where I can tell that you're thinking about things. You got centrally located things. Your avenues are very very nice. Um, I do. Um, think that your um, attention to detail is really great too. Your, for a concept, you guys are actually getting, you're drilling down on a lot of things, you know. I do like those sun shades. I like your in, innovative, innovative uh, use of materials. Um, I think that you're thinking, you're already thinking of how to, how to maximize what you can do here. So um, that's definitely coming through. Um, yeah, the uh, um, thinking of the entrances is, is um, is uh, you know you're really conceptually thinking very well about it. You know monumental trees. I really do also like the uh, um, the sculptural berms. I think it's a very nice detail, both for you know the general grand entrance of you know Fountain Grove and Mendocino. You know it's a huge intersection, so you've got to equally sort of announce this project as well. The buildings will do that, but to have something there that, you know, is drawing people in and catching eyes. Um, so that's a really nice detail, while also having a pathway going through it and keeping it um, human scale. Um, that's uh, my only uh, real comment is um, to 
to draw that human scale the, 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 throughout the entire site and really keep that in mind as you're thinking about the layout. And that was where um, my comments or my question before about the uh, bicycle lanes um, and the streetscape came into there too, because you've got these um, large buildings. Um, it would be, um, in one hand, it, I can see both sides of the argument to increase that density, get four stories, really get that out there. I also know that you also have to think financially and pencil it out. Um, and if you create the you know four stories everywhere, you're gonna really increase the massing. Um, you guys are, are having to you know ride the line where you're in this in these large large intersection, you got the highway, you've got also Kaiser right next to it that we, we can't forget there's a hospital next door, which is huge, big blocky buildings. Um, and so you also have to balance, you know, if we want to make this whole block, which is a very long block, um, huge buildings, then uh, that's going to, um, it's going to, you know, it, it could be a, a very huge kind of canyon <laughs> um, aspect to that, that end of Mendocino. So, um, so really think, continue to kind of push the, 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 the leafiness, the, the human scale. Um, uh, the, well, I think the innovative, innovative, innovative uh, use of materials will be really great to continue bringing that in because, again, to kind of contrast with Kaiser right there, um, to make this, um, you know, it, it's already looking very residential, which is great, but to really emphasize that it's not in, you know, an extension of this huge um, monumental block. Um, colors could do that. Um, the, the green is a little drab and I would like to see something a little more vibrant, um, but I also, you know, I, I also think that Warren has a good point that we don't need to sort of always be pushing just, you know, candy co colors everywhere in Santa Rosa. It's, uh, um, you know, I, I, in, one of the things about that is I, just to bring that up, but I also, from the the level of detail and, and thought that you are all putting into this, I trust that you're going to be going into a very well thought out um, and uh, um, very tasteful um, uh, final product. I think it's it's um, it's really great. So um, really, it is uh, to consider that to to keep in really keep in mind the human scale, um, and I I think it's it can be um, uh, tempting to to want to build everything out as much as possible, but to really also remember that this is a place, you know, it's homes, it's it's a neighborhood. You guys are creating a neighborhood um, in this, this little site. And so to just remember who's gonna be there. Think about kids walking around, you know, people, everything. So, and I know you're doing that. Um, and uh, I think, um, yeah, I look forward to uh, look forward to seeing the the market rate come back to us. But I think the site plan is really great, and I'm very excited to see um, the affordable housing section um, uh, be built. So, thanks very much. Thank you, Adam. Eric, comments? Well, first, thank you. Uh, it is in depth, well done, uh, with great detail. So I I really appreciate it, and you are well prepared for all the questions, the entire team. Uh, so thank you very much. The, uh, I do agree with Henry's um, idea in regards to the 4B building, in regards to making that a mini grocery store that's gluten-free to help out Warren here, and uh, which I am, and uh, coffee shop, et cetera, uh, you can put if you can find a merchant that can sell diapers, they can sell it from one end of the spectrum to the other for all the tenants there. Uh, so um, I, again, I, I do think it's, you know, and all joking aside, I think it's a really good idea, uh, something that would that would help. Um, I do have a concern in regards to, I'm curious to see what ends up happening with the traffic study. Um, there's some, some issues there, maybe thoughts about and I see that the north entrance driveway is uh, a right turn only when exiting onto the street, which is a great idea, but maybe making that one particular entrance as an entrance only and the exits coming from both the middle and south driveways. Uh, but again, I think the traffic study is gonna, will give you more information in regards to that. It's just uh, an entrance there is just too close to that busy intersection and the speed, you know, maybe a speed survey that goes on uh, my concern is 
people pulling out into front of traffic with the, at that speed. So uh, I think it's a great project. Love to see it built. Love to see it get the project get funding um, for sure. And um, uh, it's unfortunate what happened to the previous residents, but at least you know you got to close that chapter and, and move forward. So uh, really well done. Really well. Great presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, um, I would echo everything that my fellow board members said. I think that uh, the site plan is amazing. Um, the more I kept looking at it, I was, it's just really activated um, in, in numerous ways. And as you went through your presentation, you, you talked about all the ways that it's activated and I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, you've built, um, on paper anyways, uh, a very, uh, you know, community oriented, uh, well thought through uh, layout of where the buildings are located and, and how people are going to interact and, and I think you know Adam's right we can get even further into the minutia on on each space on its own and, and really bring those spaces out uh, in total um, to make it even greater uh, uh, I'll echo what Eric just mentioned about the north entry um, I think it's problematic. I, I really do also like uh, what you've done with it to make it pronounced from a, a landscape standpoint and having the dual uh, access. People can stay on um, Mendocino. They can also come into the property there. But I think that it might also be appropriate to look at um, a slow down lane so you can get off the street uh, faster. Um, it would open up, you know, the driver's sight line a little bit better. Um, I think Eric's correct. You're coming down off of Fountain Grove, making a left there. Uh, it's a tough spot to be, you know, pulling out and making a right. Um, it's a tough spot to be pulling, stopping and making a, a right um, as well. And then the same thing coming off of the, um, the overpass there. Um, you know, people are paying attention to the stoplight and then when it's their turn, they're they're going. So, um, it, you know, it wouldn't be the end of the world if it stayed as it is, um, but just something to look at there. I think there's also a decent elevation change at that location, um, three or four feet, um, if I read it correctly. So just, again, Eric brought it up. We'll, we'll let you figure it out because I know you're capable. Um, Let's see, what else did I have? Uh, the, I brought it up a little bit earlier, the uh, screening of whatever ends up being on the rooftop. I know you've got a you know five foot parapet, um, but some of those units could be uh, well in excess of that, seven, eight feet. And so you might end up wanting to screen those with the similar architecture, obviously. Um, and I think Henry put it best, you know, looking at this package is hard to kind of find a way to really make it better because I think you've probably gone through several iterations of it yourselves and have really vetted it through and it's clear uh, in what you've delivered. Um, if we could pull up the elevation one time, I just wanted to point out one thing that uh, jump, keeps jumping out at me, so I'm just going to say it and then you can do with it what you will. Um, let's get, yeah, keep going. Can we get just like a yeah, elevation, not a rendering. Yeah, so it's, oh, go back one. Yeah, so it's uh, this space right in here between those two. I, I kind of feel like I want to see the horizontal siding come down to this level. Um, I, I, and, it, and maybe it's just actually right at these towers. I, you know, again, some to explore. Um, it just it just seems like it's broken up here for not a whole lot of space that you're getting with the stucco, especially from a perspective view. It's the only thing I saw. Um, good, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Ceiling height. <Yeah. laughs> Anyways, you'll figure it out. It's just something that kept catching my eye as I reviewed the package. Um, any other parting comments um, from board members after you've heard other people? Real quick, when, when you did this um, print here, these are beautiful colors, They're just a little more saturated. I'm not saying jump out of the, the, uh, the hue of the chromographic, but I think that's what I was And as an applicant, did you have any questions based on uh, any feedback that you've heard? 
staff, anything? Super. Well, it's a it's a great project, and and I think you know you, the words of encouragement are only the words of encouragement. But uh, you've got a lot of work cut out for you and getting it financed and built. So, uh, best of luck to you in that. Thank you. Okay, on to item number seven: board member reports. Are there any board member reports to be had? Seeing none. Item number eight, department reports. Seeing Bill shake his head, there are no department reports. And that will bring us to item number nine, adjournment. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.